back to your pews. We're so thankful, Brother Brown, to be with us this morning, this week. He is a friend of ABI, and he definitely has a word from the Lord for this group that is here today. And uh, So why don't we give a warm welcome to the South Dakota Superintendent. You may be seated. Feels good to be with the family of God. Amen. We're going to have a good time in Jesus' name before we head back home. And I'm just so thankful. I've been fed. I've been ministered to this week. And uh, man, night after night, God's been good. God has been so good. If you uh, have your Bibles, you can reach for those. And while you're doing that, I uh, just want to reiterate my thanks and my appreciation for this event, uh, for Brother Gill, Brother Reese, and all those involved, Pastor Grant. It's just been awesome. And everybody that has been working and laboring behind the scenes and all those in the school that are involved in working behind the scenes, that really is an element of real ministry. And uh, a lot of times we think ministry is the person standing in the pulpit, but the greatest lessons I learned at Bible college was working behind the scenes, as it really did prepare me for what was going to happen. There's a lot of behind the scenes that takes place, and I am thankful for everybody that has put this event together, and uh, it's been a joy, it's been an honor. Something like this is very important. Uh, I have a heart a passion for this region, for the Great Plains, for the North. It's not like the rest of the country. And I'm thankful for the rest of the country. But there is a special touch needed on people's lives for this area of our country. And I'm so thankful that there's a great turnout of young people that are here to be challenged, to be given direction. I know some of you have gone overseas, will go overseas, but I do believe it to be the will of God for a good number of you to stay here, to stay in the north, to stay in the Great Plains and help bring about revival in this area. Many are called, few are frozen, and here we are, the few, the frozen, the apostolics. And uh, I'm just thankful to be a part of Torch. We have an event uh, in South Dakota called Great Plains Hyphen Conference. I don't know if you've seen it out there on any of the postings or in literature. But if you are at all interested, I did ask for permission. I'm not just throwing something out there because we don't compete. We complete. And uh, Great Plains Hyphen Conference is just another uh, focused regional event for this area. And uh, I really do believe it's the will of God for us, us to have revival in the Great Plains. If they have that slide to put up Great Plains Hyphen Conference, just so you could jot that down. Uh, but it's May 25th through the 27th. It goes into that Memorial Day weekend. It's in Watertown, South Dakota. And uh, I don't know how many years we've been doing that, but every time it's just been special. There's been a great move of God. And the season of life I am in right now happened from Great Plains hyphen conference two years ago when God just rocked my world and called me to do the next thing, be a circuit rider preacher. And uh, I'm thankful. Also, uh, if you have the opportunity before you go, uh, it's been made mention, there's some stickers out there. They're Bible study stickers. And that way you can have a Bible study on the go everywhere you go. That's kind of how it goes right there. It looks all super pretty, right? And uh, it's the main Bible study I teach. And uh, God has helped us to see many people baptized in Jesus' name and filled with the Holy Ghost. And uh, I'm thankful for the United Pentecostal Church. I'm thankful for everyone in this organization. But what I believe about salvation does not come from an organization. Uh, I want to know what Jesus said about salvation. Jesus had something to say about repentance. Jesus had something to say about water baptism. And Jesus had something to say about spirit baptism. And that's the approach of this Bible study, is what Jesus said about salvation. And then if you put a picture of my family, I always love to introduce my family. It's very important to me. I love my family very much. My wife and I 
have been married 18 years. This coming December will be 19 years. Got married when we were 12, and uh, I love my wife very much. She's a powerful woman of God, a licensed minister of the gospel, and uh, most of the sermons I have have come from her. And uh, my three children, Noah, Grace, and Eden, they're just fantastic, and I'm thankful. And I say this every time as well, and it's not vain repetition, it's a God-honest truth. One of the near audible voices of God I've ever heard was he said this about my wife. He says, if it was not for her covering, you would be in hell right now. And so it's important, you young people, as you're single and ready to mingle, when that all occurs, you better make sure you are mingling with the right person. You want to get married to somebody that is spiritual, not somebody that is carnal. You want to make sure your covering is a prayer covering. And I'm thankful for a praying wife. If you have your Bibles, we're going to go to 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. I'm going to read a few verses, verses 13 through 16. There's a number of friends I'd like to make mention of, but I would leave some people out. So I'm just going to say I love all y'all. Give honor to those elected, rejected, neglected, disrespected. God bless all of you. 2 Corinthians 10, 13, if you're there, say amen. amen. If you're not, say woman. If you're just going to be not happy at all, just say amen. All right, got one non-happy person. But we will not boast of things without our measure. Some things you can't boast about. Paul says, we can't boast about what we haven't reached. He says, but according to the measure of the rule which God hath distributed to us, a measure to reach, even you. We haven't reached everyone, we haven't reached everything, but God wants to give a measure to reach somebody. God wants to give you a measure to reach somebody. It says in the book of Romans, chapter 12, verse 6, it says that God has given a measure of faith to all of us and that we ought to prophesy according to that proportion of faith. Or simply put, do not shortchange God. God puts something inside each and every single one of you, an element, a measure of faith for you to distribute to someone that needs this faith. And God granted that measure to reach this church through the Apostle Paul. But Paul's desire is he wanted a greater measure to have a greater reach. The measure he had reached to a certain point. But he wanted an increased measure to have an increased reach. Verse 14, he says, we stretch not. Someone say stretch not. We stretch not ourselves beyond our measure, as though we reach not unto you, for we are come as far as to you also in preaching the gospel of Christ. If we are not intentional, we won't stretch ourselves beyond our measure. We won't stretch ourselves beyond our reach. And I celebrate Everything and everyone that has accomplished over time, the boundaries in which you and I live in, the districts that have been established, the churches that have been planted and established. I thank God for every church. I thank God for every section. I thank God for every district. But God wants us to stretch beyond those boundaries. I am persuaded that we've been working within our boundaries for far too long. We've been working and operating within the comfort of without stretching ourselves a little further than we could. Verse 15 says, not boasting of things without our measure, that is of other men's labors, but having hope. Someone say hope. We need to have hope that when your faith is increased and that is the mission of God today 
is that you would have an increase of faith so you can have an increased reach. We shall be enlarged by you. By your increase of faith, we will have an increased reach. By your increase of faith, we will have an increase in our movement. God wants us to stretch a little further, and God wants us to reach a little farther than we currently are now. He goes on to say in verse 16, to preach the gospel. Someone say, preach the gospel. In the regions beyond you. We can't boast of what we've not done, but I do have faith that shortly we will be boasting about things done that we have never done before. I believe that God wants there to be an increase of faith in this closing moment of torch and that increase of faith is going to create an increased reach. If you believe that, would you reach your hands to God? I pray right now in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, not by my might and not by my power, but by the Spirit of the living God. I pray you can do what we cannot do. I thank you, Jesus, for every element of faith as in this room. I thank you, Jesus, for every vessel that you have put a proportion of faith in. But I pray as the apostles pray, Lord, increase our faith. I pray, God, that you would open up the windows of heaven, roll back the roof of this church, fixate a ladder between heaven and earth. I pray that the angels of God would ascend and descend upon this congregation and in the name of Jesus that there would be a baptism of faith. Let a word of faith go forth. May we prophesy according to the proportion of faith. I pray there could be an active resident gift of faith imparted to this generation. Would you lift your voice? Would you shout unto God with a voice of triumph? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Turn to your neighbor, poke him in the eye, tell him we walk by faith, not by sight. Hallelujah. I want to speak about regions beyond reach. Regions beyond reach. And you will know when faith truly has an increase because our reach will have an increase because true faith will put flesh on it. It's the writer of the book of James. He says, faith without works is dead. If we really do have faith, we'll put some flesh on it. We'll put some action on it. I want to have that kind of faith. I want to go beyond belief and I want to go into action. I have mentioned before that, you know, we don't lack inspiration. It is Pentecost drug of choice. Our struggle is application. It's applying that which has inspired us. And I thank God for what has inspired us the past 48 hours. But in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I pray we put some flesh on our faith. I pray we put some footsteps in the gospel. I pray we put some reach in what God is wanting us to do as a movement, as a oneness apostolic movement. I want to reach souls. I want to reach this region. I don't know all that is represented here in this room, but I know that there are some from Iowa. 
There are some from Minnesota. There are some from North Dakota. There are some from South Dakota and no doubt the surrounding states as well. And I'm thankful that we are convening together right now. And I pray in Jesus' name when we leave, we leave with an increased burden for our state and an increased burden for our region and an increased desire to see revival that we read about in the Bible. I am not persuaded that it's dead, it's done in this area. I believe the greatest days lie ahead in North Dakota. I believe the greatest days lie ahead in South Dakota. I believe the greatest days of revival for Nebraska are on the cusp. I believe the greatest revival for Iowa is about to happen. I believe the biggest breakthrough Minnesota has ever seen is about to occur for we are in the last and final hour of the church of the living God. I wonder if there can be an increase of faith that greater, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the north. It is important that we have moments and meetings like this. We can't live in this meeting. We have to leave this meeting. But it is imperative anytime there is a meeting such like that you find yourself in attendance. I know we are busy, and I know there are many things on our calendars that we could only go to so many of them. But when there is something regional with a specific targeted focus to reach the area that you preside in, you should make a concerted effort to be there. Why? Because the Spirit is going to be there, and He's going to speak what a region needs for a revival. I thank God that there's a group here today that's been here this week, that there is a desire inside of you to reach a region. I love it how it says in Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 19 and 20. There was seemingly an impossible task that was set before them to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem in treacherous times. The Bible says, I said unto the nobles and to the rulers and to the rest of the people, the work is great and large. The landmass of Minnesota, the Dakotas, Wyoming, Iowa, Nebraska, it is large. It is a large landmass. But this is a great work that you and I are a part of. But because we live in a rural area for the most part in these lands, because of the expanded geography of the landscape, we find ourselves that it says in verse 19, we are separated upon the wall, one far from another. If you're like North Dakota, South Dakota, and you're like these Great Plains areas, your nearest fellowship is going to be a hundred mile drive. We're, all, we're working the same wall, but sometimes it doesn't feel that way if we never come together. But when you come together, you find out we are not districts that compete. We are districts that complete. A region that has a targeted focus from a God who has a plan and a purpose. I believe in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I feel it so strongly that it is time to close the gap. It is time to close the distance it takes for an individual to find a church with truth. It ought not take a hundred miles for somebody to find an apostolic church with apostolic truth. It ought not to take 50 miles for somebody to get in their car and try to find a spirit-filled 
called Jesus Name Baptized Church. I believe it's the will of God that every five miles there's an apostolic church. I believe it's the will of God that even within one mile, because of mass population, there are multiple churches within one mile because... I believe it. I believe it. It's not going to be a great distance for us to come together. I'm not saying in 50 years. I'm not saying in 30 years. I'm telling you in less than a decade, God is going to reduce the distance it takes for Minnesota to find fellowship. God is going to reduce the distance it takes Dakota to find fellowship. I wonder if there's someone in this room that believes that's the heartbeat of God. And so it says in verse 20, In what place therefore you hear the sound of the trumpet? Resort ye thither unto us, our God shall fight for us. As I mentioned, when the announcement goes forth, when the advertisement goes forth, and Tut Torch does probably the greatest job ever of just campaigning and let everybody know that this event exists. When that announcement goes forth, when that post goes forth, when that notification goes forth, we just need to resort. I'm going to come together. I'm going to come together because we are coming with one mind in one accord in one place place and suddenly there's going to come a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty I'm glad I was here last night I, I, I'm glad I was here last night I could have been somewhere else but I'm thankful I was glad when they said unto me let us go unto the house of the Lord I know you're young and you're vibrant and you're full of energy, but every day that passes by is a reduction of that youthfulness, is a reduced energy, is a reduced day on your time clock. I want to read from the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verses 1 through 7. I'm going to do the impartable sin and I'm not going to read from King James Version. I love the King Jimmy. It's my favorite. I memorize scriptures in King Jimmy. But every once in a while, sometimes uh, another translation kind of helps us to catch something. So I read from the New Living Translation. If you need to go, you're dismissed. <laughs> but verse 1 from the New Living Translation of Ecclesiastes 12, reading from the inspiration of depression. He says, don't let the excitement of youth cause you to forget your creator. I'm glad you're excited, but don't let your youthfulness and your excitement of being a young person cause you to forget your creator. Honor him in your youth before you grow old. Don't decide to live for God when you get old. Live for God now. Don't do something for God when you get old, do something for God now. Because guess what? You're going to grow old and you're going to say this statement. Life is not pleasant anymore. Get off my lawn. <laughs> the day's coming. All of us. So he says in verse 2, remember him before the light of the sun, moon, stars is dim to your old eyes. And rain clouds continually darken your sky. Not a lot of sunshine in the north. But you should remember him. Before your legs, the guards of your house start to tremble. Because when you get 39 years old, I don't move like I used to. I'm not here to play my violin, but I'm telling you as a 39-year-old hobbit, I don't feel like I used to. 
I could still jump a little, dance a little bit, but every once in a while when I come down to the ground, something like kind of just zings. And then I pull this out. It's what happens when you get old. So make the most while you're young. Because your legs are going to tremble. Your shoulders are going to stoop. It says, remember him before your teeth, your few remaining servants. You don't get another set of baby teeth. You're going to take care of these guys. Because they're going to start falling out. Especially if you don't take care of them at all. And then it says, the women looking through the windows, your eyes. That's why I'm wearing these. Because I can't see like I used to see. I see you all fine from a distance. But reading's a little differently right now. I remember being in the will of God one morning eating Cinnamon Toast Crunch. And I looked down and all of a sudden it was Blurry Toast Crunch. And I had to pull that spoon away a little bit. And then a little more. Then a little more. I'm like, what? That made me so mad. Because I like to see something that's approaching my face. And I had to get these things called readers. Some of the most humbling thing you can go through, aside from being short. <laughs> but I got to remember him. Because these windows are starting to close. The shades are starting to close. And I don't see like I used to. It says in verse 4, remember him. Someone say, remember him. Because the door to life's opportunities, it is closing. And the type of work you can do presently is fading. There's only a certain window of time that you have certain opportunities. There's only a certain window of time you have a certain amount of energy. And so why not make the most of your youth now? Why not do the most you can do for God now? Do not wait till you get older. Do not wait till you have to get a set of glasses. Do not wait till you have to go out and get a walker. You can do something for God now. Would you lift your hands? Would you lift your voice? Come on, lift your voice. Lift your voice. Come on, why you got a voice, use your voice. Come on, why you got strength in your hands and shoulders? Would you use that right now? Would you use the strength of your youth to lift your hands? Would you use the strength of your youth to lift your voice? Right now, come on, in the name of Jesus. Somebody say in Jesus' name. Remember him. Remember him. Because the door to life's opportunities is closing. The sound of work is fading. Now you rise to the sound of the chirping of birds at the crack of noon. But that sound's going to faint. Remember him because before you become fearful of falling. Some of you ain't scared. You worship with abandon. When you get older, you worship with caution. Curves don't look the same. You look at the curb and you're like, hmm. you approach life differently when you get older. Remember him. Now. It says, before the hairs of your head start turning white like an almond tree in bloom. Well, if you're being shamefacedness and apostolic, it would happen. Fire me. 
The caperberry, whatever that is, no longer inspires hugging and kissing. The day's going to come, folks. I think you think you only think one way, but the day's going to come. You're going to get old. Things are going to change. And it says that no longer we must make sure that we are remembering him before we near that grave. It is our everlasting home. The mourners are going to weep at your funeral. You got one shot at life, and I know you feel forever young, but there is a place called eternity where your youthfulness pales in comparison. And there shall we be, God willing, ever with the Lord. I want to end up on the right side of eternity. I don't want to end up on the wrong side of eternity. I want to go to heaven, but I do not want to go to heaven alone. I want someone in my region to go to heaven with me. I want someone from my school to go to heaven with me. I want someone in my neighborhood to go to heaven with me. I want someone at the workplace to go to heaven with me. So remember your creator in verse 6 while you are young. Because the silver cord of life snaps and the golden bowl is broken. Don't wait until the water jar is smashed at the spring and the pulley is broken at the well because the dust is going to return to the earth and the spirit will return to God who gave it. There is a place called heaven. There is a place called hell. And we need to remind ourselves ever so often that there is a place called heaven and there is a place called hell. There is an afterlife and you are going to dwell in one of those two places for all all of eternity we're going to meet our maker I believe all roads lead to God it's just a matter if you're going to be at the great white throne of judgment or you're going to be at the judgment seat of Christ everyone's going to stand before him and he's going to point you to the right or he's going to point you to the left what road are you on I want to be on a highway of holiness I want to be on this apostolic road I want to be on the old paths I want to be on the road that gets me into heaven. So I'm asking you, those here that are 12, those here that are 16, those that are 18, those that are 25, those that are 30, whatever age demographic you find yourself in today, what are you doing with your youth? What are you doing with this window of opportunity that you are in right now? I think I said this some nine years ago at Torch Conference. There's only one time in your life that you're going to be going to middle school, that you're going to be going to high school and it's paid for you are a paid full-time missionary now because after high school you're going to have to pay your own bills you're going to have to work a job but right now you are full time ministry you get room you get bored you get three full meals you get a chauffeur that takes I don't got a chauffeur that takes me to the mission field, but you got a chauffeur to take you to the mission field. You. <laughs> Somebody say in Jesus' name. What are you doing with your youthfulness? What are you doing with your age demographic? We need a generation that is going to rise to the challenge. We need to be a generation that enjoys being challenged. We need to be a generation that gets familiar with conviction. God, I am sick and tired of services absent and void of conviction. Conviction, I thank God for it. It's godly sorrow that works repentance unto salvation, not to be repented of. I thank God when a man or woman preaches the word of the Lord and there's something pricked in my heart and it calls me to action. God doesn't want to just increase your faith. God wants to increase your movement. God wants you to move with your faith to those that do not have this faith.
We need to be a generation that's willing to sacrifice. College students that are here today that feel a call of God to the ministry, I hope you're willing to sacrifice. I, I'm telling you, graduation day, it's, it's, it's where you're just kind of like the lights come on and you're like, whoa, now what? And you'll, you, you, some of your false notions or premonitions that you thought Bible college was going to provide for you thought, well, if I go to Bible college, that means I'm going to get a church placement. I'm going to become a full-time minister. I'm going to be a full-time musician. I'm going to get these platforms. I'm telling you, that's not how this works. It is a small percentage that transition that way. And it's not because they're superior. It's just how it unfolded. But you got to be willing to sacrifice. And so you know what? God called me. And if I don't get paid, and if I don't get handed over a church, I'm willing to do whatever you ask of me. I was 22 years old. My wife and I, we just graduated Bible college. And we came to Watertown, South Dakota. We didn't have a job for three months. We were looking. We were trying to find a way. And God helped us to find a job. Two jobs for eight years. It was hard going. It was hard living. It was hard working. Working. And I thank God for every single day that crucified my flesh and my pride. I thank God for every day that built some character inside of me. I thank God for every trial, for every tribulation, for every gut-wrenching moment. You got to be willing to sacrifice. And I'm telling you, the world... Is your oyster. You don't have to sit and ride the pine like, oh, nobody gives me an opportunity. Oh. You look around you. Hell has enlarged itself. There are endless amount of soul. There are eight billion souls on the planet with a good majority going to hell. And you're worried about getting paid. You're worried if you're going to be on the circuit being known in preaching. God help our motives. God help our spirit. For there is a hell and we have the truth and we ought to go to those without the truth and say I don't need a pulpit to open the Bible. I don't need a pulpit to find a person. God get me to a person. I'll open your word. I'll open my mouth. The real world. It's outside. What we're doing in here is not the real world. This is just two exercises. One, to prepare for there. Two, to prepare to go out there. That's about it. Should sum up church for the most part. Preparing to go there and preparing to go out there. You can't live in here. You can't live in here but man we sure can feel confident in here I could preach like this very easily in this atmosphere I put me on the corner out there and watch me do that And if you ever get the opportunity to stand behind a pulpit and hold a microphone, you be careful while you start chirping. And you start commanding and telling everybody to go win the loss. And revival and healings. And you start, well, where's the miracles? Where's this? All that kind of stuff. Where were you at on outreach yesterday? Where were you at the prayer room before service? It didn't get exciting there, did it? Prayer, the word, intercession. I'm telling you, the mission is out there. 
I mean, I watch, I watch people get exercise and flex their faith so much in church. They think they think there's something. They got that mic by the power and the authority of the Holy Ghost. Get out. And they won't even hand someone a church card at the coffee shop. They've never even told their classmate about Jesus. Were they all flexing in the pulpit? You know, anyone heard of Tyrannosaurus Rex? You guys know what T-Rex is? Dinosaur? One bad mamma jamma. You don't mess with T-Rex. And he got a bite. He's got a roar. He's fierce. He's comfortable operating in what he's operated in. But give him a pair of shoes and say, hey, I want you to, I want you to tie your shoes. Where is it? We got a picture? Put that up there. No, you don't got a picture. I see it back there. There you go. That's a lot of Pentecostals. A lot of apostolics. You could dance. You could worship God publicly here in this room. You could talk about Jesus. You could talk about how much you love the truth. But let's get you a pair of the gospel shoes of peace. And let's see if you know how to tie them and walk out of this building and witness to somebody. That's really where it's all at. Don't show me your shield of faith here. Put on the whole armor of God and go out there. I wish there would be a faith rise inside of us that says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't get me wrong. I love this conference. I love camp. I love, I love convention. I love those gatherings. But to be honest with you, I, I'm not exaggerating. I'm not making this up. I'm not speaking hyperbole. I'm telling you the God honest truth. I can't wait to get out of this building. I can't wait to be back in my region. And while I'm in this region, I'm going to witness too. Yesterday at the hotel, I'm walking out. I'm in the van. My girl comes running in. She says, Daddy, a man just fell. I think he got electrocuted. I don't know. I go in there just to see if my daughter's imagination is accurate and there's a dude laying face down with a ceiling caved in and a ladder laid there and they're calling the ambulance I could just try to say you know I gotta get the torch I gotta go be here no that is a moment of opportunity to say hey can I pray for you he said his back hurt I said in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ not by my might and not by my power but Come on, people. We got nothing to be afraid of. We got the gospel. When's the last time you stretched? When's the last time you stretched? Are you just prancing around like T-Rex? Running around this place, and I, I, I support it, I celebrate it, I thank God we were doing it. But let's get your shoes tied. And if you don't know how, like right now, I used to be able to get my head like to my ankles. I could barely reach my cankles. You can lose your flexibility. You can lose mobility. That's why we shouldn't just celebrate what God did way back when in our lives. Daily stretching. Daily reaching. Daily striving. Daily pressing. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Will you be challenged? Will you sacrifice? You feel tough. You feel like watching Bible college students, maybe not, not, not apostolic Bible institute. You guys are on it like bubonic going supersonic fighting the demonic. 
my days in IBC, oof, yeah, sure, you betcha. I was better now, thank God. I was there as IB Carnal. There was some wicked stuff going on. Not because of the leadership. I honor Pastor Paul Mooney. He's powerful, amazing, godliness, holiness. But there was just some crazy stuff going on in the school. Hey, we could act all we want here. But it's all up there. Reaching. Reaching to regions that we've not touched and tapped into. I want to go beyond my limitations. I want to stretch myself. I want to be challenged. And there's times I wish I could say I never struggle with pride. I wish I could tell you I never struggle with arrogance, but that's a lie. We're all human. We all wrestle and battle with pride. And there's days I thought, I thought I was something. I remember I was working in a Native American reservation and South Dakota, a good hour north of me. It was at a treatment facility where uh, it was a detox center, and there was a 12-step program. And I was the fifth step, the fifth step pastor. And basically, that's their like, confession. When they're in their right mind, they pour all their, their stuff out and their life stories. It's horrible, horrible stories. Not, none of them are good. And... Uh, one of the people I was working with told me about their daughter that was in hospice care that was dying of cancer. She was like 9, 10 years old. And she asked if I go visit. I mean, this is, this is before you had your, 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 your smartphone with all the GPS stuff. I mean, you were, you were using like MapQuest if you were fortunate. And I, couldn't, I couldn't find this place. And I, was, I have no idea how I found it. I mean, I was out in the middle of nowhere. And I saw this, this trailer out on the, the prairie. And it's kind of like, I don't think anyone lives there. But, yeah, you should see some of the conditions people live in. And I was there, and the elder answered the door, an old man. It was that lady's father. And I, uh, I told him who I was and what I came to do. And he was angry because he was not into Christianity. He was into the tradition of his elders and in uh, that spirit world. But because of the situation, he just kind of pointed down the hall and didn't say nothing. And I walked down there in that hall, and there's a room at the end, and I walked in, and I was not ready for what I saw. There's this, this girl all bloated with cancer, a little 9, 10-year-old girl fighting for every single breath. And any faith, any personality, anything I thought I had just poof, gone. And I barely can muster up a word to pray over her. And I prayed, and short time after she died. I, I can't tell you for a fact that maybe if I would have fasted 80 days, something would have happened. If I would have prayed 20 hours a day, something would have happened. I have no idea. But I definitely came face to face with the reality that's not going to be my humor that gets her out of that bed. It's not going to be my personality that gets her out of that bed. It's not going to be some sort of, oh, look how cool our music is that's going to get her out of that bed. It is going to take someone that has a hold of God and that can be sled by the Spirit that walks in spiritual authority and spiritual dominion. There are real devils. It's a real dark world. There's real sickness. There's real atrocity. And you better get a hold of the real thing. You really, really better get a hold of God. You better get a hold of a prayer room and get a hold of the doctrine. Get a hold of the prayer. Get a hold of fasting. Get a hold of consecration. Get a hold of evangelism. Faith just seems like I got sucked out of this room. Not a lot of people standing up now. Not as many clapping now. Because we're talking real things. Real things. You can feel real good in here. But you can feel really exposed out there. You can't fake it out there. You can fake it in here. I've seen plenty of preachers grab a microphone and prophesy. I prophesy, blah, 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 blah. It ain't even real. 
People prophesying that you're healed and it never gets accounted for. I'm sick and tired of fake church, fake ministry, politics, all this junk. We don't have time. There is a hell. There is a soul. And they need an apostolic young voice. If you want the real thing, lift your hands up, lift your voice, cry out to God. So there's, there's no telling how many times we got out of being exposed by saying, oh, must not be God's will. Read Matthew 17, verses 15 through 21. Boy come with a, a father comes with this boy who's a lunatic, possessed of the devil. Twelve apostles. Not one. And if you get one apostle, that's cool. Twelve! And could not cast out that devil. We would come to this conclusion. Well, it must not be God's will. We all prayed for the boy, nothing happened. Twelve apostles prayed for the boy, nothing happened. Must not be God's will. But all of a sudden, the need is before God. And Jesus cast that devil out. So I'm not going to cop out by saying must not be God's will. I don't know God's will, but I'm praying, God, help me to be sensitive to hear your will and to pray your will. But I'm going to keep praying, and I'm going to keep pressing. I'm not going to give up on one town I'm ministering in or another town I'm ministering or another soul I'm ministering. I'm going to keep praying. I'm going to keep believing. Jesus said, this kind goeth not but by prayer and fasting. How's your prayer life? How's your prayer life? Are you praying daily? If you're not, you're not going to reach regions beyond you. Are you praying more than 30 minutes a day? You can disagree with this all you want, but I just am not persuaded that you're, not, you're, that you're going to reach a region. You've got to increase with the prayer. The deeper things of God are found in an extended time with God. And you've got to get a hold of God. Someone who lacks confidence lacks his presence. But the people that are in God's presence longer have greater confidence when they're out these walls of this church. They're not intimidated. It's not arrogance. They're not cocky. They're not prideful. It's just that they were in his presence. And they saw what his presence can do. And they said, God, I'll be a channel. I'll be a vessel. I'll be a conduit. I will go. I'll put some feet on this faith. I'll put some momentum in this God. And all of a sudden, they begin to do the impossible because they were with Jesus. Let's lift our hands. I'm going to hurry up. Let's lift our hands. I want revival. I want revival across the whole world. But I am consumed. I am obsessed. I am fixated on the north. 
on the Great Plains, on missions districts. It is not the will of God for us to continue as we have. It is not, I, don't, I do not diminish anything that has been accomplished. We are here because of the sacrifice. We are here because of the years of faithfulness. And I honor all of our lineage, all of our history. But the baton is being, the torch is being passed to another generation. And we cannot accomplish what is set before us by lowering the bar to less sacrifice, less consecration, less prayer, less fasting. I know how to make people mad. It's a gift. It's one of my nine gifts of the flesh. We'll take Jesus' name literally. Jesus name baptism, literally. We'll take Holy Ghost infilling, speaking in tongues, literally. We'll take miracle signs and wonders, literally. We'll take fasting, oh wait. I'm on a media fast. I'm on a Daniel diet. I just know I lost three quarters. Yeah, that's fine. We take everything literal, but crucifying this flesh. Fasting is not eating, and eating is not fasting. It's, it's, it's really is that simple. Repeat after me. Eating is not fasting. Fasting is not eating. Now, you might be refraining from something, but if you're eating, that's not fasting. I should just say musicians come, right? I'm telling you, we are behind. We are not in the revival that God has destined for us. And it's going to take a radical generation that is passionate, that is not afraid. That You want to know why Pastor Campitella yesterday was bold as a lion? Because that's how he is in the prayer closet. That's how he is at in consecration. He's not afraid. He fights these fights privately. So when he's before you publicly, there is no intimidation. Look, I'm not scared of anyone in this room because I have stood toe-to-toe, face-to-face with the spirit world of South Dakota. I've been toe-to-toe, face-to-face with people that have opposed the doctrine. I believe this doctrine. I believe this message. And there is nothing, there is nothing that's going to deviate me from the mission and the ministry and the purpose of God in the north lift your hands lift your hands and lift your voice Now, I'm not saying you're going to hell because you're not praying an hour a day. I'm not saying you're going to hell because you play video games. But someone's going to go to hell because you won't stop playing video games and go reach somebody. Forget the moral side of Netflix all the movies that we watch, the time, the time alone should condemn us. I'm, 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 not, I'm not your pastor. I'm not telling you how to live. But just a little glimpse of how I live. When I finally got obsessed with South Dakota, when I got consumed with the land and fell in love with the land, I stopped watching movies, stopped watching shows, I wanted to make sure that I didn't give in to lust anymore. I, I completely shut that world off. 
I was in Bible college. I remember playing video games. We used to play Curfew Halo, we called it. We played Halo till the crack of dawn on Xbox. We connect four Xboxes together and, and do all that at Bible college. Praise God. I remember one morning I walk outside and there's trees down everywhere. Buildings knocked down. God spared our electricity in our apartment to play Halo. Thank you, Lord. I'm like, what in the world happened? And I go to the school and everybody's like panicking and weeping and embracing each other. I was like, what's going on? Like a tornado came through. I had no idea. <laughs> you can be oblivious to the danger you're in. You can't discern what you entertain. And the entire time, everything that would cause me to have caution and warning was just completely blocked. I haven't played video games since I was 20 years old. I'm 39, 19 years since a video game. I'm not self-righteous patting me on the back. I'm saying I am obsessed. And it's going to take some people that are passionately obsessed and fixated. If we're going to actually turn Minneapolis around, St. Paul around, if we're going to turn Des Moines around, if we're going to turn Sioux Falls around, if we're going to turn Bismarck around, if we're going to have a radical apostolic revival, it's going to take a group of consecrated young people that say, I don't care what they're doing. I don't care what they think is okay. I want to get fixated on reaching the lost. I got to reach a region that is beyond me. I got to go somewhere where the name of Christ has not been named. I got to go to a neighborhood where there's not an apostolic church. I got to go to a city that's never heard Acts 2.38. Two years ago, I'm, I'm, I'm wrapping up. Two years ago, there's that Great Plains Hyphen Conference. Chris Green is preaching, and he's, he's sharing the story of his, everyone's got a COVID story, right? And his COVID was he was in Portland, Oregon. And that year was supposed to be one of evangelism, tent revivals, crusades all over the state of Oregon, having revival and starting in the epicenter, the cesspool, the seat of Satan there in Portland. But all of a sudden, COVID happened, everything shut down. All of a sudden, the riots happened, the city's on fire, like literally. And you can't go anywhere. And so... He's so depressed, he's so aggravated, and he comes across a flyer that says tent revival in Portland. And he's like, these guys missed the memo. And there's some charismatic group. And he's like, you know what, I'm going to break curfew and sneak out and see if they're really doing this thing. So he goes out and he finds it, and the place is packed. And there's miracles, signs, and wonders. And he was, he was really curious to see what was going to happen with the rioters. But he said it was like God put a force field around that. As rioters were trying to encroach, they could not overtake. And the Spirit of God just swept in that room, and people were being healed. People were getting filled with the Holy Ghost. And God convicted him and said this. Listen. God said, they're doing more with less. And you are doing less with more. They are making more sacrifice with less truth. And you have more truth, and you're making less sacrifice. And when he said that, I mean, God smote me. And God said, you're comfortable, Mark. I'm like, comfortable? I live in South Dakota. But here's the truth. You can get comfortable anywhere. Because all of a sudden we finally got our breakthrough and we finally broke the hundred barrier and things are starting to happen and, and all of a sudden people are getting the Holy Ghost every month. I thought we arrived. I mean, I didn't really think that because I was still trying to press it. But God just said, you're comfortable. And a friend taught me this. At some point, delayed obedience becomes rebellion. So I turned to our associate pastor. We had the conversation. You're the pastor. See ya. I got to go to the next town. 
I got, I had no idea. I had literally no idea what we were going to do or how we were going to do it. All I knew is I need to start walking by faith all over again. I need to start getting dependent on God all over again. Because when you walk into the room and you're comfortable every time, you're in the wrong room. I want to be in a room around people that convict me, that challenge me, that cause me to want to consecrate more, to evangelize more, to pray more. I don't ever want to walk into the room and think I'm the most spiritual person. God, convict me. God, convict me. And God wants you to... It's like, you. anyone remember your first day of kindergarten? Your mom and dad are forcing you out the door, and you're like, man, what did I do wrong, mom? And you're in school with your little cartoon backpack. And you're like... You were scared to death because that wasn't your comfort zone. But by fifth grade, you're king of the playground. But then you graduate and you're in sixth grade. Now you're someone else's lunch money. Then you make it through middle school, you're eighth grade, you're the team captain of the basketball team. Then you graduate and you make it in freshman high school and you're on the B team and you're the water boy. You see the progression? You graduate, but you're back at the bottom. That's how you know if you're graduating in the spirit. But if you're always at top, you're that 15-year-old still in fifth grade. God wants you to graduate. Where you're, you're so dependent on him all over again. Walking into Watertown, I ain't scared. But walking into Millbank, a town of 3,300 people. Walking into Webster, a town of 1,800 people. My, my knees are shaking. I got cold beads of sweat. I'm just like, God, I, I don't know if anyone's going to come. Oh, my goodness. I don't even know these people. I don't even live here. And here comes this rough-looking dude, this farmer, and I'm just like, I'm a little pansy boy. You know, and I'm just like, I'm just shaking. I'm telling you, there's nothing like it. I'm like, yes. I mean, God. All over again. You need to get in the most uncomfortable, awkward situations like a sheep amongst wolves and say, God, I need you to make it through this. I need you to survive this. Would you lift your hands? And I, I can go through stories. We've been one year at this, just going from town to town. I've been just reading about these old circuit rider preachers, reading about the Methodists. I've been reading about our old pioneers of Pentecost and the lives they lived. I've, I've never sacrificed a day in my life. When I read Bill Dross of Pentecost, when I read Oma Ellis's autobiography, when I read about Benny DeMerchant, when I'm reading about the life and ministry of Billy Cole, when I'm reading about uh, uh, Brother Bernard's father on the Korean frontier, when I'm reading about Wynn Dross over there in El Salvador, when I'm reading about these stories of these missionaries, the Laird's in Central um, uh, Africa, this woman who just had a baby, she would leave her baby and her husband after birth, and she would go 45 miles to get to this, this place where there's cannibal villages, and she was treating the chief with a spear wound 
wound in his chest for three months straight, twice a day, every day, 45 minutes there, 45 minutes back, a second time, 45 minutes there, 45 minutes back to treat a village where they would eat her. And this lady didn't even have the full truth, and she's ministering to that need. But after three months, that chief stood up, his wound was cured, and he called all the cannibal regions, all the tribes. There was hundreds of cannibal tribal leaders that came from all the surrounding area and he pointed to that white woman and that white missionary and he says you listen to them I'm telling you there are people that are making greater sacrifice to regions that we've never reached God help us to reach across the street help us to reach in our district help us to reach in our school help us to reach us all I know this is not for everyone I believe it is for everyone, but I know not everyone's going to respond. But if there would be a group in this room that you are willing just to practice simple obedience and say, God, I want to reach a region beyond me. I want, I want to go to somebody that doesn't have this truth. I want to, I want to leave torch, not just inspired. I want to leave torch actually being the torch being the salt of the earth being the light of the world a city set on a hill that cannot be hid is there someone here today that you feel that call that pull on your heart this altar is open right now God is calling a group of people to step out by faith I'm, in, in this time that we've been here in South Dakota doing this next town ministry Again, I can go story after story, but I'll give you a quick one. We were just doing prayer walks throughout this community. We prayed and we prayed and we prayed over this community, and God spoke to us saying, this is, this is where there's going to be a church. There's a, there's a people here. There's salvation here. There's a revival here. And so we obeyed. And so by faith, I just went to this visitor center to see if we could use their, 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 their room, if we could rent the room just to teach a Bible study. That's all I want to do is teach a Bible study. No lights, no guitars, no, and no, no motion graphics, no cameras, no stage display, none of that stuff. Just, I need Jesus, and I need to teach the truth to a lost soul. And I'm telling you, I was, I was scared to death. And as I started telling the lady, listen, listen, as I started telling the lady, sign this contract that I'll pay you every month. Just let me teach a Bible study in your facility. She said, I know of a building, a church building that nobody's used in a long time. You got the picture of the outside of a church building? If you could put that up. And they took to this church building there in the winter and it was owned by the historical society they took us inside that building we began to look at it and they said what do you think about it and I said man this is really nice and they said do you want it I said I, I, yeah sure he says it's yours free we sign over the contract the deed it's yours Everyone would like to hear a story like that or experience that. But before something like that ever happens, you got to reach beyond your comfort and step into places you've never stepped before. And the place was a wreck. It was a mess. I didn't know how we were going to fix it. But all of a sudden, somebody heard a sermon from Canada that I taught on pornography. And the person all the way deep south heard that message. And they reached out to me. And they said, can we do something? Something to help you. I'm a contractor. I'll, I, I got a crew. I'll come up and do any project you want. And that man drove up a crew from Texas all the way up to South Dakota overnight with the crew. Put the inside of that building. I, I wish I had other pictures to show how mess. But he tore that place up. Put in the guy. We got carpet. We got it all painted. It's beautiful. It was some I don't know fifty, eighty thousand dollars of work and labor. We didn't pay one dime, not one penny. I'm, I'm, God is able if you are willing. Right now, right now, there's a crew at that church 
working on it because we have tapped into reaching to people in jail, people with addictions, people that are downtrodden, and they have gotten assembled a crew of people that need community service and they're trained labor, trained skillsmen. And so all these people with addictions in jail are coming and fixing that building. We needed more money to fix the basement. And all of a sudden, a widow who I never met from another state had God speak to her. She wrote a $60,000 check to fix that building. I'm not bragging. I'm not boasting. I just want to glory in this. I glory in God for the things that he has done. You just got to be willing. You just got to go. There's no telling what God can do in your high school if you just teach a P7. There's no telling what God can do in your college if you just start a CMI. There's no telling. But will you do it without promise of pay? Will you do it without promise of prestige? Will you do it without promise of ever being known in our movement? That's what matters. I thank God for this open door that I've been able to travel for the past nine years. It might close next year. I have no idea. But if it does, I, I'm not depressed. I'm obsessed with South Dakota. You got to fall in love with your land. You got to fall in love with your region. Last verse and I'm done. I really am. I don't even know how long I've been preaching. But Psalm 102 verse 13 and 14. God quickened this to me before I came up here. It says this. Thou shalt arise and have mercy upon Zion. For the time to favor her. Yea, the set time has come. I'm telling you in the spirit, in the Holy Ghost, and I say this fearfully, I believe that prophetically applies to us here in the north. I believe now the time has come that God is going to favor his people in the north. God is, I'm not saying he had not favored the people in the past in the north. Do not misinterpret my words. But I'm telling you, there is a new chapter unfolding. And there is a new fresh fire and fresh wind that is coming. But look at the key. The key is verse 14. Thy servants take pleasure in her stones and favor the dust thereof. you got to fall in love with your land. you got to get in covenant with your land. And stop speaking negative about North Dakota. Stop speaking negative about South Dakota. Stop speaking negative about Iowa. Stop speaking negative about Minnesota. Fall in love with the dust of your land. Go back home. Get a jar. Scoop up the dust of your land. Put it in a vial. And hold on to that. And pray over your land. Pray. Let that dirt Feel the fire in your heart. God is about to send a fire to the north. Would you lift your hands right now? Would you lift your voice right now? I speak it over Minnesota. I speak it over North Dakota. I speak it over Nebraska. I speak it over South Dakota. I speak it over Iowa. I speak it over this region. I speak it over Montana. I speak it over Wyoming. I speak it over Colorado. I speak it to these lands with large mass and not a lot of churches. God, turn this thing. Turn this thing. Turn this thing. Give this generation another their heart. Give them a heart that's willing to sacrifice. Give them a heart that has your heartbeat, which is soul. Come on, travail. Come on, Zion, travail. Travail for your church. Travail for your land. 
in the name of Jesus in the name of Jesus in the name of Jesus I bind the spirit of fear I bind the spirit Lord of intimidation you have not given us a spirit of fear but power love and a sound mind I release faith I pray an increased faith for an increased reach lift your voice lift your voice don't lose it don't lose that burden come on feed that burden feed that burden feed that burden feed that burden stoke that fire stoke that fire there's going to be a rural revival there's going to be a rural revival the next town's going to have a new church come on come on believe again believe again Come on, begin to intercede for your land right now. Come on, begin to intercede for your land right now. Intercede for your territory. Intercede for your community. Intercede for your college. Come on, begin to war in tongues. Begin to war in the spirit. Begin to pray with authority. Come on, don't look around. Don't look around. I want you to plug in. In the name of Jesus. Come on, war. Come on, you learn about spiritual warfare in a session. Exercise it. Exercise it. Exercise it. Hey! War, war, war. Fight the good fight of faith. War a good warfare. The weapons of our warfare, they are not carnal. They are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Make it obey Jesus. Come on, why you're young? Come on, why you're young? Oh, the window of opportunity is closing. Come on, why you're young? Why you're young? Why you have vision? Why you have energy? Come on, that's it. Come on, intercede. Come on, let your body be given to this. Death worketh in me, but life in you. Come on, come on, come on. Intercede. So life can be birthed in another. Let death work in you. So life can work in another. Hey! 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 Oh, la, 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 
Rabaha. Come on, there's an open door right now. There's an open door opportunity right now. There's an open door opportunity right now. Pray big. Pray bold. God, as we read in the beginning, in the book of Romans, in the book of Romans, I need you to listen for just a moment. We're going to pray. We're going to pray as a body. Just listen for a little instruction. We read from Romans chapter 12 and verse 6. I referenced it towards the beginning. And it says that God has given to every man a measure of faith. And I believe God has begun to increase our faith in this room. But it says begin to prophesy according to that proportion of faith. Or don't shortchange God. We have prayed, we have interceded, but I want us to begin to proclaim I want us to begin to declare. I want us to begin to speak by faith and authority. And for those that get uncomfortable with that, I'm telling you, you, you got some battles that you need to get victory in. God really wants us to be bold in our prayers and begin to declare things by faith. The last miracle building that we got is $1.3 million on, on four acres of land. I'm not going to go through all the details, but we... We prophesied to the wind over that building, and God gave us that building debt-free, never took out a loan. It was an absolute miracle. In another town of 1,800 people, we are in process. I don't know if it's going to happen or not, but a store owner reached out to me. We prayed over that community that God was going to give us a building. We declared it by faith, and now potentially by the end of this spring, we're going to be given a storefront, an owner that I only met one time. I never met before that. He just called me and said, I felt God speak to me, a, a resident there in that community I never met before. He says, I got this storefront. I'm going to be moving my business, and I felt God tell me to give it to you. And so we're about to possibly get a bill. I don't know if it happens or not happens, but I still believe that God's going to give us a building regardless. And you got to just start getting bold in the Holy Ghost. But that confidence comes from being in his presence. Extended time in God's presence will give you a godly character, will give you a godly passion and a God-given faith. I want us to pray not begging right now. We're going to begin to declare whether you start praying strongly in tongues or whether you begin to prophesy to the wind and begin to speak the word of faith over your community. We're going to reach regions. There is going to be a drastic increase of churches and new works, daughter works, preaching points, Bible studies. I believe it's so strong because there is a resurrection of a pioneer spirit in the north that is coming right now. God wants to raise some pioneers in this house. Would you lift your hands and would you begin to speak faith over this region? Would you begin to pray powerfully in the spirit right now? Come on, pray. Believe. Declare. Come on, lift your voice in authority. You are not a beggar. You are a believer. You are not a beggar. You are a believer. You are a child of God. You are a child of God. Lift your voice. Lift your voice. Maya na karabaraya. Yes. 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 That's it. Come on, push. Come on, lift your voice. Come on, speak faith. Speak faith. Speak faith. 